Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, and welcome to the Marine Traffic webinar on the dry bulk markets. My name's Bill Lines, and I'm a director at Navigate PR. We're a public relations agency based in London, and we specialize in the maritime business. Um, earlier this month, many of us would probably be maybe of enjoying a few days in Athens for Posidonia, but sadly that wasn't to be, but we thought that maybe we could run some webinars with the Posidonia organizers uh, that might perhaps fill the gap in some small way. Um, this is the first in a series of webinars over the next couple of weeks. We'll also be looking at the container markets. We'll be looking at how data-led decisions will help the industry possibly recover from COVID-19 lockdowns. And also a webinar looking at how shipping emissions could be reduced by improving the way in which ports and ships interact. But today is all about the dry bulk markets. And it seems like we've timed this pretty well, haven't we? Um, the BDI, Baltic Dry Index, is higher this week than it's been actually since the beginning of the year. And I looked just before we came on, on air, it, it was at 1527 points. That's up 281 points on yesterday. And it seems that average daily Cape size earnings are $25,280 a, a day. Um, but the question is, is this just is this demand led or is it sentiment or is, is China firing up its economy again? To answer these questions, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. We have Yan Chun Chang, who's head of UNCTAD's Commodities Branch. We have Manu Ravanu, who's Joint Chief Executive of IFCOR, International Shipbroking Company in Switzerland. And we have Yanis Trutfilis, who is a Greek ship owner and member of the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping. So Yanchun and Manu will each give a short presentation. Um, and I'm going, going to invite Yanis after to give his perspective as well. But we'd really welcome your questions too. So on the right, I think there's a chat function. So if there's any questions that you have, just pop them into the chat and we'll do our best to, to answer them. I can't promise we'll answer everyone. There's quite a few of you on this on this call, but we'll try our best. But let's hand over then to Yan Chun in Geneva, who's, as I said, is an analyst with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and she can dig, dig deeper into the demand side. Yan Chun. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you all today, sharing our views on global trade, especially the trade on dry bulk commodities. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to make a, a disclosure. The material presented here today, including my remarks, only reflect the views of the individual authors or speaker. It doesn't necessarily represent the view of the organization. Let's get started. First, you probably want to know what UNCTAD is and what we do here. Um, as Bill introduced, uh, UNCTAD stands for UN Conference on Trade and Development. It's a UN organization uh, uh, focusing on trade and sustainable development issues. We are based in Geneva, Switzerland. Most of our 400 colleagues are economists. Uh, we analyze the trade investment and technology issues from a global per development perspective. Take my team as example. We have 14 economists working on various commodity topics involving both soft and hard commodities. Uh, recently, we have been uh, writing and having projects on cotton coffee, cocoa, gum arabic, cashew nuts, rare earth, gold, natural material, etc. But we are not specialists on individual commodities. We do not follow the market movements of individual commodities as many of the audience here do. My brief talk today will focus on the demand side. As we all know, it is very difficult to forecast the commodity demand or commodity exports or imports. At UNCTAD, we usually don't do forecasting. Our research focuses on long-term relationship between commodity production trade and the country's developed outcomes. We look at the long horizon of time series data or panel data instead of a high frequency data. But recently, we were pressured by our main clients, which are your member states, to conduct timely policy research related to the Brexit, to the trade wars and the COVID-19 epidemic this year. So today I'm going to share with you two recent pieces of research we produced at UNCTAD. One is our global trade update published last week. The other is a study we published 
last month to examine the impact of COVID-19 on China's commodity imports for year 2020. So today's short presentations will only give you a snapshot of what these uh, two studies are. And I will include the links to these two reports in my presentations for you to take a closer look after. So here, this is the first slide uh, on projecting the global trade volume. So on projecting the trade volume for year 2020, there have been uh, uh, many different figures. The well-known ones include WTO's projections published in early April. At that time, WTO predicted that 2020 global merchandise trade could decline by 13 to 32% this year, depending on the different epidemic scenarios. In our OnCast global trade update, we used the national trade statistics and estimated global merchandise trade will decline by uh, up to 27% for the second quarter of 2020 after 3% drop for the first quarter of 2020. There might be some rebound on global trade for the third and fourth quarter, but for the whole year of 2020, we estimate a 20% drop in global merchandise trade values. There are other estimates on global trade based on different sets of information. For example, according to a recent note of UBS published this week, the global trade so far has not collapsed. Using the data on merchandise volume delivered on ships, UBS found global trade volume only dropped by 6% by early June. So actually, there is a high uncertainty on all these forecasts as the epidemic is still developing and the real global trade picture is hard to grasp. For what it is worth, I'm showing you uh, the regional and individual countries' trade trends from our report. We see in all regions, trade has fallen dramatically, except in East Asia and the Pacific. For Middle East and South Asia, trade has fallen most in April by almost 40%. Countrywide, all major trading economies imports and exports for figures further deteriorated in April and May. The only exception is China's exports grew by 3% in April, but it is too early to conclude its exports start to recover because again, in May, uh, we see the figure showed a drop of 8%. If we look at the sector uh, uh, data, it is clear that the economic disruptions brought by COVID-19 has affected uh, some uh, sectors uh, much more than others. The pictures also look differently in April compared to the first uh, quarter. From the graph, you can see the agri-food sector was affected the least this year so far. Preliminary data for April indicates further declines in most sectors, especially a very sharp contraction in trade of energy and automotive products. Now, let's turn to the second study. So, uh, it is, uh, this is a study we did in the branch. It is a preliminary assessment to estimate the impact of COVID-19 on commodities exports to China. When we decided to do this study in April, at the time we only had January, February imports and exports data from China's customers. But since China is the biggest commodities importer, uh, one fifth of world commodities exports are shipped to China. We think focusing on commodities exported to China is a good starting point. Um, we are currently updating the analysis by incorporating the China's March-April trade data, as well as the new trade data released by the US and the EU. Here are the key findings of our study. First, we find commodity exports to China will decline this year. Second, compared to the scenario without COVID-19, commodities export to China this year could drop by 15 to $33 billion. Third, for those uh, CDDCs, which are the, uh, 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 the short, short term for commodity dependent developing countries, the group of countries we often uh, work with, their commodity exports to China will decline as well, but at a smaller scale between three and $8 billion. Please bear in mind though, 
These estimates are indicative at most because our simulation doesn't account for a number of variations, such as commodity price movements, policy responses like export bans or stimulus packages, or indirect effects of COVID-19 or second wave of the COVID-19. But our hybrid simulation method, we think, offers a reasonable balance between technicality and traceability of results, and therefore allow for some uh, uh, transparent interpretation. Now, uh, let's go to individual dry bulk commodities. So here, um, let's look at iron ores first. China is the largest iron ore importer, which is clearly shown in the graph on the right. On the left is our simulation results. Here we graph China's imported iron ore for year 2019 and the year 2020. Then because when China published the January-February trade data, uh, this data was published in aggregate. So we therefore aggregate the historical trade data and, uh, and simulate future import data on a two-month basis. So on the graph, we have six data points for year 2019 and another six point data points for year 2020. Uh, the, the, here is not very, uh, the green line, the green line here uh, is our benchmark scenario, where, um, which graphs the historical by monthly import data for 2019 and the simulated by monthly data for 2020, assuming the imports for year 2020 will grow at average uh, growth rate observed for the same period uh, during the previous three years. So we use the uh, year 2017, 18 and 19 as a, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, historical uh, period. Then the blue line here is our COVID-19 scenario one, which describes the COVID, which uh, we, where January, February, 2020 data are used to construct this scenario. After January, February, 2020, we assume the realized deviation from the benchmark value is maintained during the following uh, uh, four months for the March, April, uh, by month period, and as well as for the May June by month period. Then after June, China's commodity imports are assumed to grow at the same rate as in the benchmark scenario. Then the orange line here is our COVID-19 scenario two, uh, which is the more optimistic scenario where we assume after June, China's commodities imports will catch up on levels with the benchmark scenario. For iron ores, China's iron ore imports increased by 17% in January, February, 2020, compared to January, February, 2019. But this increase uh, from the graph, you can see, it is significantly below the pre projected rise in imports based on previous year's evolution, shown in the benchmark scenario, which indicates that the import demand shock due to the COVID-19 on iron ore is clearly negative. So countries such as Australia and Brazil may be affected. For the next dry bulk commodity, aluminum. So the impact of COVID-19 on aluminum is also negative, even though in both the benchmark scenario and scenario one, the increase, you, you see the increase uh, uh, in the COVID-19 scenario, but this increase in the COVID-19 scenario is below the projected increase in the benchmark scenario. It is worthy to note though, China's aluminum imports uh, in 2020 looks like uh, much, much higher than the third and fourth quarter of 2019, uh, which may indicate some countries could benefit from the increased uh, import demand of aluminum from China. These countries include Guinea, Australia, and Brazil. Then in our paper, we did uh, uh, have this uh, individual country analysis as well. For copper, which is the next dry bulk, copper, the next dry bulk, uh, bulk commodity, uh, we find uh, the trend very similar to aluminum. China's copper imports for several bi-monthly periods in 2020 are higher than those in 2019. So some countries could benefit from such increase like Chile, Peru, Mongolia, and Australia. 
Then the next one we are looking at is coal. Uh, coal is a very, very important uh, dry bulk commodity and China is also uh, an important coal importer. But its coal imports have been fluctuating quite a lot because the government tried to cap uh, its in import at around 300 million tons per year. So what data for the first two months uh, 2020 shows us is that China's coal imports this year was a big jump from its November, December 2019 imports. And this big jump also makes the simulation results very different uh, from other commodities. The results show that the coal imports will increase more in the COVID-19 scenario than the benchmark scenario. Then because of this, countries such as Mongolia, Russia, and Australia could see a surge in their exports of coal to China, even with the uh, uh, COVID-19. Now next, let's turn to grains. Uh, we know over the last uh, 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 decade, China has become an important uh, grain importer. Uh, in our study, uh, this commodity groups is also important because it shows important uh, uh, variation in demand conditions. Uh, uh, in the in the January February 2020 data compared to the historical data, let's take uh, soya beans for example. If without COVID-19, the demand from China at the beginning of this year should have been quite high from a year ago. The actual imports data shows an increase in import demand, but at much smaller scale. So, which also indicates the negative impact of COVID-19. However, after further drop in March, April, our simulation shows soy, soil imports are projected to experience a very strong rebound for the second half of the year. So for wheat and rice, the simulation shows uh, imports demand for wheat and rice may decline significantly because of COVID-19. Then for the last two uh, dry bulk commodities, I'd like to uh, show you. Uh, the simulation results look very different for the uh, uh, maize and barley. Uh, from the graph, you can see there's a strong increase in imports demand after COVID-19. So what do these import demand shocks mean for individual green exporting countries? Uh, we know Argentina and Brazil, for example, are large exporters of soya beans. Australia is the main exporter of barley to China. Uh, in our study, we find largest gains relative to benchmark projections obtained for countries like Australia and Argentina in relative terms. In absolute terms, Brazil is the largest uh, winner, but of course, there are also some losers. In terms of losses, we find Myanmar could suffer a big loss in absolute terms uh, as a large export of rice to China. So I will stop here and I will be happy to provide more further details or clarifications during the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Yan Chun. Um, we'll turn now to Manu Ravanu, um, who's also in Switzerland in Lausanne. Um, he runs IFCOR, a shipbroking company with offices, I think, in 14 different locations, cover both dry bulk and tanker side of the business. Um, Manu, can I hand over to you, please? Sure. Thank you very much, Bill. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, I'm talking from sunny Lausanne, the Olympic capital, as Bill said. So. Um, as he mentioned, I have the honor and burden to uh, take forward IFCO, which is a shipbroken company. And we're present all over the world. Uh, and we have, luckily, a fantastic research team who, who helped me to present today a few topics around the supply of vessels in the dry bulk industry. So just to clarify that I'm not uh, an analyst myself uh, and I'm still active as a, as a broker myself. So I will give you some kind of a practitioner uh, view on the market and on the supply. So what I did actually is that uh, I started from a macro picture um, and looking at the long-term trend to then focus a little bit more on 2020 and what will happen uh, beyond 2020, or try to guess what will happen beyond 2020. So let's get started. Um, 
I wanted to start with, with a graph showing a little bit the evolution um, of the dry bulk supply over the years. As you can see, um, it has been growing uh, steadily, and if not in certain periods, extremely uh, violently, um, and led us to a market which is today uh, very well supplied, if not too, too much supplied. Uh, so we, we can see in green uh, two uh, areas where the supply has been growing uh, way above the average. And this has happened uh, because of, of course, the cyclicality of shipping. So I put some comments here talking about the long industrial cycles of shipping, which, which last some 15 to 20 years. And this to say that very often, uh, the present moment is very much dependent on what happened 15 years ago. And I will come back uh, during the slides on these two phases, 2006, 2009, and 2012, 2015. These were two phases uh, when a lot of external factors uh, have uh, influenced the supply. A lot of in in external actors of the shipping market have influenced the supply. So let's go to the next slide and have a look at some crucial moments in the last years. Uh, first of all, as you can see on the left uh, graph, uh, we wanted to emphasize a, a crucial moment uh, when the super cycle has ended, uh, so in 2009, early 2009, and we have entered a, a new cycle uh, in shipping, which can be, uh, can be defined as a choppy uh, cycle or uh, the choppy decade, as I like to call it. Um, we, of course, had a demand crunch in 2009 as you, as you in, and 2008, actually. And uh, that has, of course, occurred, like Murphy Locals, uh, also with the arrival of a lot of new buildings ordered during the uh, super cycle. So that has created, uh, let's say, the base for what we see uh, being a decade of a relatively low market uh, and, in average, below historical levels. Uh, in 2013, uh, the market was ready for uh, a pickup again. Unfortunately, the heavy investments made by financial players uh, who have invested various billions of dollars in new buildings have capped uh, the market and have uh, basically brought uh, one, of, one of the worst crises in shipping in 2015 and 2016. Um, Obviously, during the first years of the new decade, so the new decade called as 2010 to 2020, uh, we had a, a lack of demolition, which uh, basically made the market completely oversupplied. Now, to move forward, uh, what I call the choppy decade, uh, as you can see here from the BDI evolution in the last 17 years, is uh, what, what, I, what I tend to, to define as a decade uh, full of you know, short cycles, lots of volatility, uh, go and stop patterns, um, basically a lot of investments made in very, very uh, short uh, spans of time. And um, that has created immense volatility uh, over the last years and has created a market which has been trading uh, on, the, on the dry bulk below historicals uh, in, on average uh, during a lot of these years. Now, talking about volatility, uh, I think we, we have analyzed uh, both from a, uh, an analytical point of view and from a uh, broking point of view, practitioner point of view, uh, the volatility has been increasing lately a lot. And this is due to various factors that are written on the right. Uh, what I like to call the, the amplification of new speed is simply that uh, today, uh, you know, news, of course, travel uh, much faster than any time before. And this actually is leading to increased volatility. Uh, the derivatives market are becoming um, more liquid and more visible. And that in itself also creates volatility to the physical market and influences the physical players. So all the volatility that we had uh, in the last uh, months uh, and the last couple of years is due to various factors, including also uh, the, the Chinese uh, government, uh, let's say, um, facility in, in increasing and decreasing uh, the imports and exports. Uh, also, um, we, have, we have seen that the decisions taken by various owners and charters have 
basically allow the market to overshoot most of the time. Um, so this to say that, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm working on the Cape size market and just to give you an idea, the, the Cape size market has been uh, going through a major increase in the last three weeks of some uh, 400%. Uh, so this obviously is created by other factors than the one de depicted on the right, uh, though clearly helps uh, the fact of understanding that the volatility now makes very difficult to invest in shipping. Uh, now, what one of the of the major and focusing a little bit more on 2020, uh, here we have a, a graph showing the evolution of uh, basically the deliveries and demolitions, and of course uh, what we are um, aiming at understanding is uh, where are we going from here. Obviously, during uh, the last uh, actually uh, couple of years, uh, the demolition has been. Uh, not great, uh, and because obviously the market was at better levels in 2017 and 18, and even 19. Uh, what we see now in 2020 are a couple of other uh, factors that can influence uh, the demolition book. Of obviously, COVID-19 had a, a quite quite an impact until today, and it delayed and it actually erased uh, the demolition card. Uh, from owner's choices uh, in the last months, simply for logistical reasons. Uh, the demolition now is coming back at a at decent pace, uh, and we believe that in the coming months we will see further, further demolition uh, due to various factors. Uh, obviously, the, the macro business environment is not great. Um, people are a little bit scared of, of uh, the, the macroeconomic situation, and that can lead to certain uh, decision making. Um, Secondly, uh, there are also technical factors. Uh, the, of course, the, the big changes in regulations are making ships, which are less economical, uh, to be really less attractive and more of a burden today uh, in today's market. Uh, those ships uh, have to, of course, to compete with uh, more, more modern tonnage, which is more efficient and more economical. And for those older ships to be up uh, to the level of the IMO 2020 regulations, a lot of investments are needed. Um, obviously, there are problems in, in general financing, I would say, and the macroeconomic crisis has not helped uh, that bit of, of, of a factor. To move ahead uh, over uh, a little bit, uh, a more focused uh, view on the various sizes of ships, uh, what we have seen in the last years is simply that the number of ships has, of course, uh, grown immensely. And not only that, uh, the size of the ships uh, have, of course, increased a lot. So uh, the, the market players are looking for economies of scale. And those economies of scale come with larger sizes and ships that can carry basically more cargo. So we have had, uh, for instance, in 2020, a huge amount of Newcastle Max deliveries. Newcastle Max are described as 200,000 toners, uh, and these ships uh, are basically loading most of the time and transporting most of the time iron ore. Uh, and obviously, uh, we had a tremendous increase in 2020, which was, uh, I think, some 400% uh, compared to, to last year's supply. And we expect uh, the balance of the year to be, again, supplied with a lot of Newcastle Maxis. This is uh, not helping the market. Uh, this is creating uh, some kind of a cap uh, to the market. At the moment, we are having a temporary uh, squeeze and the market is going up uh, and it, it's going to provide very, very good returns for the next uh, couple of months. However, uh, we see fundamentally the picture for this year not to be as bright as the last weeks have been. Uh, the Valley Maxis are, uh, as many of, many of you know, the Valley Maxis are really industrial projects. So uh, you will not see a steady um, increase of uh, supply of those Valley Maxis. Those Valley Maxis have been built around specific projects. Uh, and we actually think that the Valley Maxis simply um, supply will plateau and simply stop at a certain point uh, because there is only that much uh, of Valley Maxis uh, that the various miners can handle. So. Uh, although they have increased the amount of a million tons dead weight available, and that has also served the purpose of having an oversupplied market. 
Uh, if you go on the smaller sizes, uh, and I'm focusing now on the Panamax front, obviously the picture is, is quite different. Uh, and we have had uh, some kind of a, of, a, of, a, of a lack of interest uh, in the smaller sizes for a couple of years. Uh, this is uh, being renewed lately. Uh, and also in this segment, we're looking at an increase of efficiencies and people start looking at larger CAMSA maxes and uh, the so-called post uh with with a more interesting eye. Obviously, the new building market is not active at all in this moment. Uh, it might be the next one or two years spending uh, on, the, on the demand situation, uh, although this is this is what uh, the, the picture looks like for the moment. Uh, if we go to, to the next slide, we'll start to look at the demolition, and I'll uh, try to be quick because I get only another couple of minutes. Uh, this is what the demolition has looked like in terms of million ton deadweight. So, as I was saying before, 2015 and 16, as you can see, have been uh, very bad years for the freight market, and obviously the demolition, which is at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, both uh, an economical decision and also to a certain extent, um, you know, simply a, a judgment of the owner. Uh, a lot of owners have decided to scrap the vessels, and that has provided a breather to the market, which has helped fueling the market uh, to better levels for 2017, 18, and partially 19. Now, uh, the the interesting factor is also trying to estimate what 2020 demolition will be. So. Um, we have seen, obviously, a, a slow pace of demolition in the last, last couple of years because the market was better. Uh, now, what to expect next? Uh, well, there are some, obviously, uh, there have been some low rates in the last uh, five months. The market is picking up now, uh, though those five months have uh, put to the test uh, some older units. And we have seen in the recent weeks um, many ships going for scrap uh, after COVID-19, uh, especially Bangladesh. Uh, and Pakistan have been more active in, in scrapping units. And this has led to uh, hopefully what we see as a, a better or more balanced market going forward. So more demolition to come, uh, which uh, we believe um, will help uh, rebalancing the market in 2020. Um, here, we, we tried to put together a graph uh, relating uh, the year-on-year -year growth, uh, both from the supply and the demand side. Uh, Jan Shun has been uh, much more uh, specific on the various commodities. We have just taken uh, you know, a, a global view, an helicopter view, as I like to call it, on, 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 the, on the situation. Uh, what we, you know, the takeaways uh, from these are that, at the moment, the supply is still growing faster than the demand. Uh, and this is uh, still an issue for the market. Uh, what, what could be a game changer is a zero supply growth, uh, which uh, might come uh, later on uh, in 2021, 2022, simply because the new building ordering has been extremely, uh, extremely low. It is not attractive today for owners to um, order new buildings. Simply the economical value of it is uh, not, not interesting. Uh, the FFA, uh, so the derivative market, which actually should uh, help liquidity is actually capping uh, the market and you have to base your investments on that. And this is becoming, of course, difficult for owners to make an investment in such a scenario, let alone that, um, you know, the technological changes uh, are and technical changes on the ships are, of course, adding to uncertainty for an owner who has to spend a lot of money to buy a ship uh, because obviously he wants to make sure that the ship uh, he will buy for the for the foreseeable future, so the next 10, 15 years, uh, will be compatible and competitive in a, a technical environment which is changing fast. Uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly on these market expectations. Um, this is an image uh, which is uh, an image uh, that is provided by the FFA curve. The FFA curve is at the end of the day. Uh, the summary of the opinions of the market players on the years to come. Uh, let's say a part of the market players. And obviously these are, as you can see, pretty flat. And we notice that on the, for what regards the Cape size uh, segment, they are below actually historical level, which are some sort of uh, mid teens, thousand uh, dollars per day. Uh, this is giving you a snapshot of what actually 
the market players are thinking about uh, the dry bulk market. Obviously, those opinions are there to be uh, to be let's say broken or uh, surprised, and I think that we will have actually a better market 2022 onwards uh, simply because the supply. Uh, will be much lower than what it has been in the last choppy decade. Um, last and not least, um, we, we actually did a little bit of, a, of an analysis on, you know, just to give a, a, an idea to the various uh, generalists or non-specialists on this webinar on what cargoes the vessels actually load. And uh, this provides a message which is that the smaller sizes are, are of course, uh, least, uh, the least uh, dependent on uh, China, on iron ore, and are, can, can count on various commodities to, uh, to make sure to, to have an investment which is viable in the years to come. Um, I think that's uh, it for me today. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, the messages I think are open. And Bill, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present a few slides on the supply. Thank, thank you, Manu. Uh, that was that was a, an interesting presentation. Let me just. So, if I could ask, perhaps if we could start with um, with Yanis, if I could turn to you, Yanis, and get your perspective on these two presentations. Um, do you feel optimistic after he hearing this, or extremely pessimistic? Look, first of all, I, I don't think that either of the presentations changed my mindset or psychology in terms of expectations. I think they are very close to the orthodox view. Their analysis was very fundamentally driven and uh, very quantitative. And it does exactly bear out uh, in numbers what we are experiencing both historically, you know, since the super size of the but also the most recent experience. I think there's somebody on the line. Uh, sorry, yep, okay. So it also does reflect the recent experience with the COVID in terms of a simultaneous demand and supply shock or a simultaneous buyer and seller strike. Um, First of all, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, your audience and to comment on this very, as I said, wholesome uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. The Hellenic Chamber of Shipping is basically the official advisor to the Greek state, and our members cover all types of Greek flagged uh, vessels, shipping, cruising, dry bulk, and all ocean-going uh, varieties. And we are recently opening up to Greek-controlled foreign flagged tonnage as well. Uh, on the ship owning side, personally, I have experience on the dry bulk only. So this, what was described was quite familiar. And uh, the last 10 years, we have been focusing on the handy size sector, which I was greatly encouraged. And this is in answer to feeling a bit more encouraged or optimistic, seems to have been the appropriate, more defensive play. It's not going to, you know, uh, line our pockets with gold, like the people that bet on the larger sizes, a big belly can bring a big revenue on a daily basis in any kind of spike, but it does keep the operating costs in line and it is closer to serving inflexible demand, which is mostly agri stuff and things dealing with food rather than energy or iron ore, which is much more development related and uh, I do remember those ugly statistics in, in back in 2009 in China with the, 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 the domestic consumption of electricity dropping 60%. And you know, the, the GDP numbers there, which are a bit uh, massaged, uh, were completely in contrast. And of course, reality always uh, catches up. I do have some comments if you would like me to, to run through them, um, but it's, it's up to you, Bill because maybe you would rather I take some questions. Now, please, just a couple of questions from the audience we've got lined up, and I would encourage any of the audience members to tap in any questions you, you might like to put. But over, yeah, if you could have your commentary to carry on, it'd be great. Thank you. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to start first with the UNCTAD presentation. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, th there was an old musical that used to be called Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. At that time, that was a kind of very incongruent title. I think this year, a lot of people felt that this actually happened. The world stopped and they did want to get off. Of course, they couldn't get off, so they buried themselves deep in home. But the truth of the matter is the world shut down. So that was a, a, an unprecedented shock, and I think it will be unrepeated. Shipping, especially Trump shipping, performed very well, continued those supply lines, showed the strategic importance and, and the resilience and the flexibilities. Um, there was a bright, there was a brief pause in the repairs and the retrofitting. This is now back on. This is now back online, and there was a big reduction in um, in the new building in the new building orders. Uh, we expect the, the trade flows to overcompensate in the beginning and then to peter to peter down. We do not expect a same aggregate demand around the world as we have been experiencing in the average let's say of the last uh, decade uh, even with the great recession going on we're expecting a reduction we're expecting a decoupling we're expecting more onshoring um and that's basically on the side of the demand uh, on the side of the demand so we're expecting the politics of world trade and some of the conflicts to reduce a bit the trade. And this is, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame for the world yeah, because trade brings us closer, shipping brings us closer, and uh, we are seeing a lot of push in the opposite direction. That's never good because then when there is a disagreement, it's not so easy to resolve and things can start resembling the beginning of the previous century, which is something all of us would, would obviously like to avoid. Uh, now over to the IFCHOR uh, presentation, which I thought was um, very analytical. Uh, IFCHOR, of course, is a very well-known participant in the in the brokering uh, business, and they are well reputed along, you know, with the top five uh, companies easily. Uh, so this was obviously also in the slides. So yes, that super cycle uh, was destroyed also by the influx of clever or hot money, which turned cold and stupid very fast. <laughs> it's still um, frustrating the market. Uh, I hope that people in, in the capital reservoirs of the world learn this lesson, that this is a simple, basic market, uh, supply and demand driven only, but it gets very nuanced, very complicated, and it's virtually impossible to model. If people are having a hard time with the virus, it is impossible to model dry bulk shipping because of the tramp element, because of the flexibility, because of the, it's so complex, the moving parts. So it's better to take fundamental decisions. And of course, again, as discussed, it's very difficult to commit capital for 20 years when you don't know what the regulation is going to be and when you don't know if the fleet will become obsolete halfway through the, the life cycle you have predicted. So these are burdens on the ship owner's mind and they are becoming burdens on the shipbuilding side and they will eventually become burdens on the chartering side as a, a constricting fleet results in higher daily daily rates which is something that we also agree and expect to see even from the end of this year and over the next two years i think the reduction of shipbuilding capacity is very positive one of the reasons those spikes were very brief is that because you have a very short lead time from many competing yards and people can come in and order a lot of ships very fast and the expectation in the market is they will be delivered very soon so it's impossible to lock in a high long-term charter that influence the daily charter and that influence the FFAs. A brief note on the FFAs. This is my only uh, more fundamental disagreement with uh, the IFCHOR presentation. And this is that we do not believe in shipping that they represent the view, the long-term view. Uh, we think they are basically a financial instrument that a lot of charters do back-to-back -back hedging. But I don't think, I think it's useful in this respect but I don't think people should imagine that the FFA levels quoted today between very few players and with a very shallow transaction are a true reflection of the market levels expected by people. 
So this is a caveat. It's not a fundamental disagreement. It's just uh, something to be aware of. Um, we don't disagree there, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> I think, I think basically on on the comments. Yes, also on the economies of scale. Yes, the long-term historical trend of shipping has been to get bigger. This reduces the ton mile cost, reduces the administrative cost, and reduces, luckily, and in line with the political agenda and everybody's benefit, also the pollution per ton mile. So this is a, it's a very positive development. To mention around World War II, the average size would have been about 17,000. And now it's about 82,000. That's a very steep, uh, very steep uh, increase. And part of the success of, of shipping in moving 90% of, of world trade in a, with a small footprint and at a very low cost. And I have some concluding comments, but maybe there are some questions in the meantime, Bill. Yes, we do. We have a question from Bas van Steinen who wants to know, does the panel believe that the recent push to the BDI may reduce the cape size? Will this filter down to the smaller vessel sizes? That's a good question. Do you, Janschun, do you want to answer that? Uh, maybe for the, for the minor bulks, you have a view going forward or, or should I? Let me know. No, please, please go ahead. Thank you. That's a difficult one. So I hoped you, you would have said yes. Uh, so thanks, Bas, for the question. Actually, um, I do, first of all, think that the, the temporary squeeze that we have on the capes is, as I said, temporary. Uh, I, I am not convinced uh, fundamentally this market on the cape size will be um, uh, undersupplied this year. Unfortunately not. Uh, it is still oversupplied. Um, and I think that we're, we're, you know, what we are witnessing today is a, is a big catching up uh, of uh, iron ore sales from Brazil, uh, which have been uh, very, very low for, for many months. And uh, the main miner there needs to, um, to ramp up uh, in order to meet uh, the sales targets. Um, China is importing at very good pace. Um, and of course, uh, there is a combination of factors which is leading to this uh, squeeze in the market. So to answer that, I think that uh, temporarily it is dragging up already the smaller sizes. Uh, I'm sure you noticed that in the last days, the pickup in, in Panamax uh, and also on Supras uh, to a certain extent. Um, though, as you can see, it is not linear with the, with the, with the increase in the capes. It is a much smaller increase uh, on these sizes. So to answer your question, if I have to, uh, you know, to take a view, uh, which IFCOR likes to do, is no, it, it, it's not going to drag it because it will be only temporary. So uh, I'm, I'm fundamentally, I'm not uh, very bullish for this year. I'm much more positive uh, next year onwards, uh, provided uh, the macroeconomic situation um, gets, um, you know, uh, gets back to, to a normal, if not a better situation. Uh, so, so I would say that for the owners that are listening, I mean, at least my advice is when there are such, um, you know, such pushes in the market, I would rather secure uh, some time charter, secure some earnings. Uh, I think it's rather wise at the moment uh, when, when you have such squeezes. So, uh, so just to answer your question. If, if, Bill, if I can add uh, some nuance to, uh, I think, first of all, I ascribe fully to this, uh, to this analysis. Uh, any temporary shift in the earnings is not going to influence anything else than that, the temporary shift in the earnings. Now, any longer term or more sustainable level up will change a variety of things, all the way down to eventually the new building price, but it will also change the two-year time charter and the longer term time charter. There is historically a cascading effect from the larger sizes down. This is partly mathematical, partly psychological. You start with a cape. If the cape gets more expensive than two Panamax, then you'll split it into two Panamax, plus a bit of a difference for the administrative uh, trouble. Then if the Panamax goes up, then maybe the Supramax will not be able to be employed in these levels. It'll go up, and then the handy will start being influenced a bit by that. We saw a bit of this. Our handy size are in a pool. 
uh, and when they were when the market was down and the supras were uh, were slamming it and doing you know 35 lots or 32 lots they were taking business away from us when the when the supra started moving along the panamax as that firmed up then they would give us some breathing space and the handies would be able to take uh, sure. a, a tick or two more but they're also the markets are not interconnected because unlike a minibus and a taxi, they don't serve exactly the same route and client. So there is some disconnect. Coal and iron, they do not have the same drivers as, you know, wood, chip, fish, sure. and grain. If I may add uh, also to answer, to finish the answer to the question of bus, uh, actually the capes and uh, the smaller sizes have lost a little bit of uh, the correlation they used to have because iron ore is driving the cape size market let's put it this way and iron ore today is a highly sensitive logistical uh, segment so every ton uh, shipped and every hour you know uh, lost is actually extremely important to the miners and the miners are resisting to the idea of splitting cape size because um, you know, they, they save a bit on freight sometimes, but this has nothing um, to do in comparison with what they might uh, actually lose in not getting uh, more uh, quantity of cargo shipped on time or shipped to, to the customer who are paying um, quite high prices and you know, the miners are retaining a lot of margin on those. So I would say in the past, the splitting between Capes and Panamax was more frequent. Uh, today, because the market is mainly driven by iron ore, it's happening less and less. Very, very nice um, gra granular analysis of the shift, which is a, a, an important shift and departure from the historical paradigm. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Pal Torson, who wants to know, how do we change owner's behavior? Um, how do we stop the habit of over-ordering Banks stop lending and public companies raise funds when rates are strong in the short term. I guess this is an impossibility, he says. <laughs> it, it's not an impossibility uh, because uh, it, it's not so much the owners that drove the market. I think that slide was, you know, overwhelming. It has been money uh, that is uh, correlated <laughs> to, to the global liquidity, the very low interest rates the very low returns. When you have four companies in the NYSE representing 25% of the market capitalization of the biggest stock market in the world, you know this economy is no longer driven by fundamentals. It's no longer allocating resources. It's no longer pricing risk. It is just parking money short term in places that will yield more than zero or negative, which is what you get for financing Germany or, or the US uh, Fed, or for parking it in a Swiss, uh, in a Swiss bank, uh, whether in, whether- they're, they're not paying much to the Swiss banks, I can tell you. Exactly, so people are chasing anything that moves and that's what's spoiling the market. Of course, certain owners or jockeys of capital are heralding this money into the market and of course, also Chinese leasing companies, which are supporting Chinese shipbuilding uh, companies, which are supporting Chinese employment, are just continuing to order ships when nobody looking at economic returns would do so. The owners are out of the market for a long time now. Yes. I, if, if I may add a few points, I agree with you. I mean, the, today, the rationale of ordering a new building vessel for a traditional owner is close to zero. Um, and, and to come back to the FFA comment you made, um, maybe I, I, I misexpressed myself, uh, though I, I didn't want to say that that's really the expression of everyone. Unfortunately, the FFA market, especially for the two, three, five years down the line, is a market for very few players uh, who have the, uh, let's say, the credit lines to, to play derivatives on those uh, years. And, this actually is putting a cap to new building ordering. If you notice the difference between tankers and dry, is actually that on dry you have a liquid FFA market or as liquid as possible for the years forward. On the tankers, much less. On the tankers, it's still an industrial project, right? So 
the new building ordering is done on the back of long time charters with the majors or with some traders. Um, in, in, uh, at the moment, in dry bulk, uh, doing long term projects is very difficult. Uh, of course, there are some grain size uh, major charters which are still interested, we're still interested to charter for longer run. But uh, guess what? They're going to look at the FFAs, and the FFAs are relatively low, below what the historical levels are. So this is putting a, a break to, to new building ordering, actually, rather than fueling at the, as, it, as it could. Um, we have a question from Amit Ozar. I think this is one for Yanchen. Um, do you see a fundamental shift of commodity flow away from China as companies start to rethink their supply chain and manufacturing locations after COVID? Um, there have been a lot of discussions on the shift of supply chains, but uh, my personal view is it will take much longer than most people had expected. It's not easy to shift uh, supply chain. Um, it ha has been happening. Uh, for example, some uh, uh, supply chain of Samsung in China uh, was shifted out of uh, 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 northern China to Vietnam, to Thailand, but it takes more than a decade. That's before COVID-19. Of course, now the motivation, motivation might be higher, but it, it will still take, uh, take, 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 take some years. Then we, uh, we see in the short term for year 2020 or 2021, China will be still uh, a very, very important uh, commodity, commodity importer for sure, uh, especially as it recovers from the COVID-19, as it speeds up its uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, uh, previously, I didn't say much because I, I know very, very little about shipping. <laughs> uh, but we have been to uh, many developing countries, some of the poorest countries in Africa. Then we, we see it with our eyes. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to have the cargoes ship, ship from, you know, uh, 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 shipped in England. Sometimes the cargo uh, shipment costs much more inland then from Shanghai to Cameroon, because England from Cameroon to Chad, it takes four times of the expenses. That's the reality you see in uh, some of the most underdeveloped regions in the world. But on the other hand, there's a big, big opportunities there. So uh, from the, as a development economist, I strongly encourage uh, uh, private sector to, uh, uh, to grasp the opportunities because a lot of lot of uh, demand there, which can be grasped. Bill, can I add something? Sure. To what is fundamentally, I'm I'm fundamentally in agreement with what you said. The same holds true in terms of land transport cost and sea transport cost, even for iron ore within China, from northern China and Mongolia down to the coastal region, it costs more than to bring it from Brazil. That's what we talked about earlier, the economies of scale and the ton mile reduction and the operational efficiency. It will take a lot of time to shift supply lines and it will take a lot of time to decouple the economies. They've been coupling for the last maybe 100, uh, over 100 years with a couple of uh, interruptions. Imagine that although the EU depends on China for about 90% of all the critical chemicals going into a lot of medicine and India as well. Despite US uh, attestations that what they will become independent of this, the EU is not even paying lip service to this idea on something as critical in today's world as dependence for medical supplies. They are still saying that the cost benefit analysis pushes them to continue to rely on third party suppliers. So. I think the same will hold true for a lot. It'll take much more to break uh, to break the lines, but they could become disrupted. And the whole concept of globalization, I think, is coming under greater under greater scrutiny. I agree. Then the data we have been seeing shows the intra-regional trade actually did not drop as much as the inter-regional trade. But of course, it depends on the regions. At least it shows that in, that pattern in Asia Pacific. But if you look at North America, the international trade actually has uh, collapsed. So uh, I think in the coming months, we will see more and more uh, 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 patterns emerge. Then uh, this discussion definitely need to carry on. 
Thank you. And time for one very final question. And sometimes the simplest questions are the hardest to answer. Um, and we have a deck cadet from the Philippines who says, I'm aspiring to become an officer one day. To be quite honest, the figures you've given are really, you know, I'm a layman, they're too quantitative. In layman's terms, what's going to be the space, the dry bulk market in the next year, two years and 10 years, because I'm on a Panamax ship? <laughs> Very practical fellow. He'll do well at sea. Can I ask anyone to dare answer that question? Yeah, it's it's a very tough question. So I would say, you know, um, if you if you fundamentally like to be at sea, remain at sea. Dry bulk will not disappear. Uh, dry bulk is a function of world economy. Uh, the world economy will change. Uh, however, dry bulk will remain in some shape or form. Um, it will probably you will you will you know you will be shifted to a larger Panamax. This is what I believe. Uh, you know, maybe in five ten years time, uh, I think you will be able to do a career. I'm not a real believer in autonomous ships. Uh, this might be uh, you know true when when I I become a granddaddy hopefully. Uh, though for the next 10 15 years, I don't see that happening. That there is too much still, uh, too much to to try, too much to study, too much to. Uh, to make sure uh, of, of the on the safety side, so I would say uh, stick to dry bulk. Dry bulk is nice. Dry bulk is actually one of the most important things uh, in the world economy, and uh, um, you know it's not going to disappear. That's for sure. It's it's more a question of of a change in in patterns, change in shifts, shifts in sizes, and so on. But uh, stick to it. If you have a good owner, uh, the good owner will know uh, what choices to make going forward. Uh, whether to to order different types of ships and be a real entrepreneur over a cycle of 15 years and not just a short-term player and i'm sure you will be fine first of all may he always have may you always have you know pleasant voyages even currently in your career and be careful and stay safe but i i agree that uh, world trade is not going to stop and especially food related and building related materials are going to continue to go around the world. I think there is more danger of shocks in the automotive transport, in the container transport, especially the very large sizes. And potentially it's forgotten right now, even in the tanker business, because as we move away from hydrocarbons, that could have a big impact but we will all continue to eat we will all continue to build and there will be fiscal stimulus which means a lot of infrastructure both in china and in the us i am certain of it and probably in europe eventually so just think of all those medieval cathedrals being built over a hundred years just to keep people occupied and uh, instead of going hungry and imagine this as you know highways or huge new cities or dams or railroads or whatever and i think there's a lot of, of business to be done now how lucrative it's going to be for any of the owners that's a different matter it shouldn't matter to the crew the crew is always uh, steadily paid well paid and they can go to any one of the i think uh, close to 10,000 dry bulk ships uh, dry bulk ships out there so carry on Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all our panelists. Thank you for your time and um, for putting together some very interesting presentations and thank you for all your contributions. Um, thanks again to Marine Traffic and to the organizers of Posidonia for helping make this happen. Um, a number of you have been asking about the slides and whether they'll be available, etc. We will be sending a link of this uh, so you can watch this again on a replay on a video. Um, you'll be hearing something from the team at Marine Traffic later this afternoon, I think. But thanks again for, for all your time and stay well. Bill, thank yes. you. Can I have one last message? Of course. Can you put up the slide I sent you, please? <laughs> Good. Very nice. This is a slide of the third world carrying the first world. But when I look at that slide today, that's from 2005 before the crisis, it's in Copenhagen. When I look at this slide, I think of our crew away from home, not allowed to make changes, carrying all the rest of us, an undisrupted supply chain, 
in the hand of the fattest. It's called survival of the fattest rather than the fittest. That the culture's name is the scales of justice being manipulated into equilibrium. So all I'm saying, a message from the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping, please consider our food. If there is anybody out there linked to the IMO or to the aviation transport or to any of the regulating authorities, the crews are essential workers. They performed for all of us in a moment of global necessity and they are being mistreated right now. They are being treated worse than discretionary tourism. So please, let us not be a part of this injustice. Thank you. Very right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, Marine Traffic. Bye. Bye-bye, Bye. -bye. Bye.